Um, feel a little hobbled. I can't quite go too far out of here without getting in the way of the screen. Uh, I'm Cliff Simpkins. I'm a senior product manager for the developer experience of Windows Phone. So I, I'm based out of our Seattle Redmond office. I uh, was out at Nokia World last week. Uh, so I've slowly, over quarters of the planet, been adjusting over to the time zone. And I, I think I'm about here. Um, here to talk a bit about Windows Phone, a lot about Windows Phone. Uh, it was 7.5. Uh, out of curiosity with folks in the audience, uh, how many people have seen Windows Phone 7.0? Okay. And have you actually used the phone? Developed for? Okay. Cool. So uh, just trying to set context. Um, and then as far as the other platforms, uh, how many are, are iOS developers? And Android? Large majority. Okay. And just on the tab, uh, so how about Android ta uh, phone and tablet? OK, awesome. Uh, so there's a lot of really good things in, in Windows Phone. We, we launched the platform last year, Windows Phone 7.0. Uh, and this last couple months, uh, we launched Mango, which I, I think is almost fitting since uh, the time I always <laughs> like getting mangoes the freshest is September. So I mean, it worked out pretty well for me. Um, but yeah, so uh, for saying hello, I'm going to go ahead and let the phone say hello first. excuse I get to play it, I like playing it. Uh, so over the next 30 minutes, I guess we'll leave 10 minutes for Q&A, uh, kind of have, just want to give you an introduction, introduction to the phone since it looks like a lot of folks haven't really seen it. I'll spend a little bit more time on there. Uh, what it is, what it's about, why it is. Uh, my manager, Brandon Watson, who you may see occasionally making news here and there, is all about why. You know, why are you here? Why are we there? Why? Why? Because without a why, it just, you just get lost. Uh, and I hope to at least answer why develop for our platform. When you have so many other options out there, why Windows Phone? And then I want to spend maybe about five, ten minutes about just giving you a quick lap through the development environment. Uh, my colleagues are going to be doing a 45 minute, you know, an app in 45 minutes, and so it's a really great session to go to tomorrow. If, if I do encourage you, if I, if I do convince you, okay, there is a reason why I want, to, I want to target this platform. We've got that. And we also have got a great booth with lots of phones and, and the tools there. So uh, in following up on that question of why, uh, we had our own question of why, right? Three years ago, as we had Windows Mobile 6, and there were several other competitors out there, uh, I think WebOS is on here, so there's, there's one less than on the screen now. Um, the, the mobile model is pretty set. And I like to think that looking at the OSs are fairly similar. I mean, you can compare apples to oranges, um, and soon we're going to compare mangoes. Uh, but uh, you get a grid of icons. It's all about applications that get installed. You go out, you find the app, you install the app. And then when you go to do task-based items, like every morning I get up and I'm like, OK, well, how early do I need to get in the office? Do I need to get in the office at 8 or do I need to get office at 10? So I go into my calendar. In this world, you go into your calendar app, you say, OK, I see what my calendar for the day looks like. All right, let me go see what the weather looks like so I know how to dress. Uh, in Seattle, I always bring an umbrella. Um, although it seems like in Bangalore, it's a lot of rain, too. Uh, so it reminds me of home. And then you know, what does traffic look like? And so you're, you're talking about four or five apps. With Windows Phone, 
we decided to take a different approach. We said, Let, let's make it about the task. Let's make it about the people. Let's, you saw the sort of these really commercials from last year as we sort of started this introduction where, you know, uh, finally a phone that saves us from our phone, right? You, you don't have to be inside your phone going from one app and out and then in and out and then in and out. Uh, what we do is we try and deliver an app that's needed to the user at just the right time. And so we like to think that it, it's more about people versus icons. And with 7.5, we kind of have this catchphrase you see there about putting people first. And as we go through the demo, I'll, I'll kind of show you exactly how that lights up and how it's not really just a marketing catchphrase, but it really is a genuinely different experience. And in the in last year, we've had a really good success. I mean, we've come from a standing start, zero apps in the marketplace. By year's end, we had over 30,000 apps. We had over 50,000 registered developers building for the platform in some sense. Uh, in some cases, uh, all those devs haven't published. We've got students in the pipeline. We have folks from India who've been registered, but they're waiting until the marketplace opened. And as countries have been lighting up for places to sell into, we have 38. Yeah, 38. So far, India got launched on the 19th as a place that you can sell apps into. Uh, phones are coming. Uh, and we're seeing about 150 new apps per day coming into the marketplace. Uh, judging by what we see as far as uh, just our internal metrics, it looks like we're on track to be at 100,000 apps by the time the summer comes around. And with the launch of the Nokia phones last week, we are really rising to be the third platform. I mean, my boss kind of says that he likes taking credit for being the one who killed WebOS. You know? and, and as we see these other platforms trying to figure out, OK, what is our why? We're just sort of hopping over them. And, and we really are becoming the third platform. And, and I'm hoping that you believe that too. And it's not just me as Microsoft kind of coming in here and telling you that. With the new capabilities, we were talking a little bit about this before coming in. Uh, in 7.5, 7 7.0 is a great base platform. We did uh, our live tiles. We put a great user experience that just differentiated. It was something different, something fresh, uh, not just copying uh, what's currently out there. Uh, with 7.5, we rounded out the platform. We added IE9 to provide HTML5 capabilities. And about 90% of that code in that IE9 web browser on the phone is exactly the same as the desktop. And so you could say for better or for worse. I mean, we could argue that for a while. But it means that you can target one browser. You can target build HTML5 capabilities and know that it'll work on the phone. It's no longer a, OK, well, I'll test it for this browser, and then I'll test it for this other flavor of the browser. It's, it provides some really nice capabilities. We added multitasking, whether that's background agents for audio, background file transfer, uh, periodic agents so your code can run every once in a while. Uh, and then fast app switching. So instead of just letting the app run in the background, uh, and here's a promise, you'll never need a task killer on our platform. It, it's a core tenant that we protect the user and we deliver a really great experience. Uh, as well as full sensors. And then back to that task-based item. Uh, you get into when a user is using the phone, when they've grabbed apps, they can pin them to the start screen so it's there. Uh, you as a developer can surface things using these live tiles to surface the information that's relevant to the user and almost tease them back into the app, right? Give them a reason to come back. Uh, and provides both glance and, glow, glance and go. Uh, we also provide an integrated trial functionality. This was a, a functionality that came over from our Xbox. So somebody can go in, they can download a trial. You can put that trial however you want, whether it's you know, 10 throws of dice or 20 minutes or maybe in the trial you get an ad or something like that. But then you can go back in and convert the thing to full they don't have to download a new app. They don't have to find a new app on the marketplace. It just converts. It's just there that we change the license, and then you change the functionality, how it behaves. So you no longer have to do this, OK, I'm going to build a light version that's free, and then a paid version that's paid, and then have to maintain two code bases. Let alone expect the user to find that paid version should they like the trial version. Uh, and then we provide the ability for apps to connect into hubs, and I'll show you that a bit more. All right. Oh, that's back, and that's forward, and we will go ahead and show you that a bit more right now. So if you want to switch over to the Wolf Vision. Now, up to last week, I was going to show Samsung, but I was told people want to see the Nokia phone. I hear Nokia is big here. I hear Nokia is big around the world. So setting this down, this is my phone. I don't really have a data connection, so some of this is a little stale. But as you can see, it just turning on the phone, it is a different experience, right? What we opted for is we, this thing called the Metro UI. And Windows was talking a bit about this at Build. But 
and this came from sort of our heritage with Zune and trying this thing out with the MP3 player market, which was instead of having menus and having icons and having grids, let's go with a bit more of an iconographic or a typographic model uh, inspired by subways and airplane airports around the world. So it kind of has that feel. You're a bit more, you see the, the icons, you see more text base. If I come into the People Hub, for example, it's very text based. We go a bit more minimalistic. We, we put the content first rather than Chrome. That was sort of another tenant, which was content before Chrome. Uh, coming in, you know, I've got my list of people. Uh, everything is integrated. We've got integrated uh, Facebook and, you know, let me see. It's also a bit interesting uh, doing this from the table. And so coming into the people, I'm getting feeds right from Facebook, from the folks, uh, from people I follow like The Onion as well as people that I, that I work with. So much easier when you're holding it in your hand. Uh, recent pictures that get published. But you've got several hubs that are in, in there, and, and hubs are areas where apps can congregate, that can collect, that are like-minded. We've got the people hub, we've got a gaming hub, where here you, all of your games sort of uh, you know, congregate you hear. It's integrated with Xbox Live, so you have your avatar, you can get achievement points. You can deal with friends requests and the like right from within the hub. Don't have any requests at the moment. As well as spotlighting. We're really big on merchandising uh, breadth apps and really bringing developers to the forefront and helping uh, users discover them as well. Oops. I don't, I'm not getting a data connection. So. Uh, back to the sort of the thing of, as I come in in the morning, okay, I've got my appointment tile right down here at the base. I can see I've got a 15 minute stand up that I'm obviously not going to make. It's first thing in the morning back in Seattle. It's, it's very late at night here. Uh, I can see that, you know, here's the traffic within Seattle. This updates every half hour showing with what bridges I should avoid and what bridges I should take. Uh, our traffic is a lot more linear and, and queue-based in, in the U.S. Uh, I can see within the USA Today, this flips around, gives me the temperature. Right now, uh, it knows because I'm in Bangalore that uh, it shows me that temperature. It gives it to me in Celsius. Okay. I've got my music hub. We're within here. Okay. I can play music, videos, podcasts. It records the history. I was listening to Madeline Peru last night. And then you also have the apps that are relevant to music right there. So again, as the user is in there, they're listening to music as they're watching a video. They can come back. The, hubs are the, the apps are highlighted so that as I'm listening to music, if I want to grab the lyrics, I can just come up going, oh, okay, I, I need to grab lyrics for the song. I don't have to go back to another grid, remember. Okay, it's on page three in this folder and then, and then go down. Just go ahead and click the lyrics. Uh, because we give integration hooks into almost everything we do, it pulls out what song you're listening to, automatically pulls down the lyrics. If I had a data connection, I'd show it to you. Um, here you've got Nokia Drive. You've got all the various apps, that, you know, Facebook, Seismic for Twitter, Amazon. I'm able to also, within apps, pin radio stations. So, for example, a couple of radio stations I listen to, National Public Radio, it's sort of like the BBC in the U.S., uh, as well as KEXP, which is a, a local Seattle station. Uh, they both come from TuneIn. As I'm within the app, I can say, okay, pin this to a secondary tile, and it goes ahead and links it there, and you can highlight information. Uh, I've got eBay, as well as a music CD that I put a bid on, which should actually, I, hopefully I got it. Um, we've got great apps. I mean, Cocktail Flow is a good example of this. Uh, it's an app that allows you to, it's cocktails. And we've got the same Metro UI. So a big, thing, big tenet that we have within the platform is the UI is, should be consistent. It should be easy to create a great app. And so we've got this thing called a pivot panel uh, where I can drill in. I can take a look at all cocktails. As you come in, if, take advantage of the accelerometer. I don't know if you can see that, but the drink elements kind of shift back and forth. And because we use the same programming model as Silverlight, this is the same as if you're doing web programming. So these are just layers. You can almost think of them as, as div tags. And as you do it, everything can shift around. 
So we make it really easy to program and build this stuff. Uh, this particular app is great. You can put in elements of what's in my cabinet. It's just a matter of clicking and opening it up. And then up top it says, oh, here's how many drinks you can actually make. And then swap over. They did a great thing in 7.5, which not only they took advantage of our multitasking capabilities, um, but they also allow for background file transfers so that if I wanted to come in and do, I think it's one further over. Uh, every month or every sort of holiday season, they provide packages which I didn't try this on a data connection, you may not be able to see. But if I, if I go back and look at installed ones, okay, so centered over there is not centered for here. Sorry about that. Uh, you can get Halloween, Halloween themed drinks or New Year's based themed drinks and, and the like and download the package, it'll go ahead and grab it for you. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, and then as well within the People Hub, uh, where you can create these things called groups. So I've got a group for family and I've got a group for coworkers. I can pin them down here and you'll see that, you know, it's telling me I've got a new mail. Uh, this sort of is, uh, is my family group, family pin, and then coworkers, which we might just be waiting. From within here, you can see I got a new email from Ben Lauer and then some other folks on the team. Going over to what's new, it's not pulling down data, but it'll go ahead. If we go to family, I've got my lovely brother. No, okay, so data connection's biting me. But it's a really great UI. Uh, in the case of WP7 Appalis, it's one of our sort of third party uh, marketplace analyst firms. Uh, they go ahead and they list like total number of apps in the marketplace, number of updates, and net new apps that came in during the last. Uh, day. It's fairly early in the day as far as U.S. goes right now, so that number's pretty low. Um, yes, but cool. Um, so that's a quick tour of the phone. Uh, oh, I guess one other thing is uh, holding down the back button was one of the net new features. So this was the multitasking fast app switching model. And so as you come in, you get an instant, the, the app comes back into, uh, back into the foreground and it's, it's executing again. Uh, we follow the fast app switching model. Uh, so as you think about what does it mean to be a background agent, what, what does it mean to be multitasking, we follow a bit more of the iOS model than we do the Android model. So when a user leaves the app, it's actually uh, sort of snapshot frozen and, and freeze, flash freeze dried, if you will, and, and kept inside of memory. Uh, so it's no longer consuming CPU, it's no longer consuming additional RAM. Uh, and we keep up to, I think, about six apps in, in sort of background, in memory. If an app is comes out of that six, or say you're using a turn-by-turn -turn navigation which just starts chewing up a massive amount of resources and it needs those resources for the app, uh, we will take and we will what we call tombstoning. So we essentially put it in a bit of a suspended animation. Uh, and that's sort of the model we had in 7.0. Uh, everything is serialized, put back in isolated storage, which is sort of your, your chamber, if you will. And then when the user comes back in, it loads that stuff back in, deserializes it, and puts it back in. And so. Uh, it typically takes an app a couple seconds to come back from, from tombstoning, which is why we'd like to keep it in memory if we can. But that was another net new change in 7.5. But cool. So if you want to swap back. And I will grab this again. Cool. And so a, a key platform tenant, as you think about Windows Phone, one area that, that our designers really took into mind, as, as we were designing, as we were building 7.0, our designers didn't just call themselves, you know, uh, program managers or designers, they call themselves fierce reducers. Because we wanted to have a very delightful experience, uh, we, we went around the point of doing fewer things but doing them really, really well. And then coming out with a model where every year we iterate, we add new features, we add new capabilities, and we just delight users by, by just rounding out the platform and really providing innovative advances. And so at the core of it, we look to balance the user experience, whether that is a delightful and responsive UX, so we always hold a certain amount of CPU and we always hold a certain amount of, of memory for the system so that the swipes always feel, uh, always feel just snappy. They're always there. And no matter if you just set up the phone a week ago, two months ago, or two years ago, it should always feel snappy. You should not have rot in that machine. And, and really, that's what it is. I mean, we like to think that, that these are probably the most personal of personal computers that you could have. 
Secondly, a user should never regret installing an application. And that, that's the approach we put with the marketplace, with discoverability, with having the trial functionality that converts in, with just one of the best ad providers that, we, that, that are out there on the market in terms of giving you back to the, to the developer as well as the user experience for the user, um, to our security model. And, and I'll kind of get into that to a second. But the user should never regret installing an app. They should never be okay, is this going to hurt me? Is it going to steal my data? Is it going to do this? No, they, they should never worry about that, and that's one of our core tenants. As well as an integrated feel. It, just like with Cocktail Flow and a lot of the other apps that are in the market today, uh, we try our damnedest to make sure that third-party developers can reproduce everything that's there in a first-party experience, that you can get those behaviors, that you get the look and feel. And ideally, we want you to, too. I mean, we don't want this hodgepodge of user experiences. We want a user to be able to walk up to an app, start running it, and go, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I know what happens when I flick right or I flick left. And then balancing that, we look into making sure we have a device that's battery friendly, that's not going to die in two hours, that it's also bandwidth friendly. And particularly as we get out, of, as we start working with countries that are not, you know, where 3G is not a given, this really becomes something that, that becomes important. <laughs> You need, we have a platform where an app will not pass certification unless it behaves properly when there's no network present. And again, that kind of is that balance, right? We have this idea that you can do caching, you can do all these things to bring that data local and be able to operate uh, when that device is not on the network. Ideally, developers, as developers, as mobile developers, you should not assume that the user always has an internet connection. And then hardened services. So as we design the, the phone, We've got this idea of sandboxing. We call them uh, least privileged chambers. So when you install an app, your app gets unpackaged and placed into this LPC, this least privileged chamber. It has an isolated storage. It's, it's very much the Silverlight model, except sort of on steroids, right? Uh, you cannot get into the user's uh, contact store. You can't override. You can't really get into the SIM. You can't get into the contact store. You can't get into, I said contact store, didn't I? The calendar. Uh, and that was the way it was in 7.0. In 7.5, we heard from developers, sorry, I just realized that I'm completely ignoring you guys. Um, we, we, we tried expanding that. We heard from developers, you know what, we, we need to get into this stuff. And so uh, we couldn't necessarily do it in 7.0 while protecting sort of the health of the device. In 7.5, we gave uh, launchers and choosers. So uh, in 7.0 and in 7.5, if you want to launch a web, uh, web page, you basically, from your managed code app will say, hey, I want to launch a web page and I want to go here. Very similar in 7.5, we gave launchers and choosers to get into the address book and into the calendar. So you can basically say, hey, I need to get a contact. And then the user is then prompted with a sort of a, I don't want to call it a pop-up, but, it, but it, it, it asks the user to choose who they want to give that thing, uh, give your app rights to. And so we're trying to strike this balance again of giving you the functionality that you need with also protecting the user's data so that they don't have to fear grabbing a malware app that's just going to rip everything and throw it up on the internet. Uh, and this improves release by release. And so how, how do we do this? Walking through sort of the architecture of the phone real quick. At the base, we've got a base chassis spec. We learned our lesson from Windows Mobile, uh, and some of our competitors are learning this lesson now, that if you don't enforce a base minimum spec of amount of RAM, uh, a single resolution, you know, and, and things like that, it becomes a very fragmented, very willy-nilly sort of market. And developers don't like that. We don't like that. It, it runs up our support costs. It runs up your support costs. And again, it comes back to that why, right? And so we've got a base chassis spec which says 800 by 400, so a wide VGA screen. Uh, they must have 512 megs of RAM. It must have at least you know, X number of gigs of memory and, and five megapixel camera and all these other things uh, and a you know, compass uh, so that you as a developer, you, you kind of know what assumptions to make. And as a consumer, as a customer, they know what they can expect out of the platform. And then we can then focus on differentiators that build on top of that, whether that's a front-facing camera, whether that's an NFC, whether that's insert optional component X, Y, and Z, or more RAM, or you know, eight megapixel camera, which uh, the Nokia phone has, which is really cool. Um, and, and really make it a, a more of a delighter rather than necessarily, oh man, this doesn't run. Um, system on a chip, we've got all the sensors in 7.5, we provided access to that. That was another 
item that we heard from folks is, why can't I get to the camera? Why can't I get to the microphone? And for a balance of reasons in those core tenants, we weren't able to do it in 7.0. 7.5, we did. Moving up to the architecture, uh, 7.0 and 7.5 was built on Silverlight. In 7.5, we updated that to Silverlight 4. We also have the XNA framework, which comes from our, our Xbox and our Windows game idea. So the idea is if you want to take 3D models, you can use you know, a best-in-class managed code game provider. Uh, we provide generational garbage collection, which was uh, much improved in 7.5. It was sort of, you could tell when garbage collection was happening in 7.0, it would stutter a little bit. We did a generational garbage collection in 7.5, which makes that much nicer and a lot less noticeable. Uh, SQL CE for databases. At the app model, uh, I covered background agents, which is new fast app switching. And we also, in 7.5, added the ability to do uh, Silverlight and XNA together, which really makes the lives of game publishers easier because when you're typically building a game, you're building those screens, you're building the sprites, you're moving things around. And if you have to do something like a leaderboard or a menu, it becomes, it, what, what we heard was it's a real pain in the ass. Right? And so what we do here is you can actually layer Silverlight data-bound controls over top of that, which makes not only painting and presenting the, database, the data, but also localizing much, much easier. Because if you want to do it in another locale that's, that's not English, then you just provide your localization strings in your, in your project, it just builds, right? It's, it's nice. Particularly for those going to simplify Chinese and Japanese characters, they found the XNA and Silverlight integration in games tremendous. Uh, also folks like British Airways, they put a seat selector, which is a 3D model that goes in there and because those are integrated, they can go ahead and take those 3D models, paint that inside of Silverlight and go back and forth. And then we've got lots of things on cloud integration, right? We've got App Connect, which allows you to make use of the live tiles. Uh, one thing I couldn't show you because uh, we don't have a data connection, but if I'm in there in search and I say, okay, I want to look for an Xbox 360, four gigs. Okay, it's a product. And then it will present to you saying, oh yeah, here's some apps that can help you with, that, with, with buying that. You know, here's eBay, here's Amazon Web Services. And even if the user does not have that app installed, we will make a recommendation. Right? So if you're in a movie, here are the movie apps. Oh, you're going to a restaurant. Oh, here's some great reservation uh, apps. And so we, we try and make a model where we bring the apps to the user and we help make your life easier as a developer. And then, of course, cloud services. You heard a lot. Well, some of you heard about that in the keynote. Uh, and then to build all of this, we, gave, we give really great tools. I mean, I think everybody in here is familiar with Visual Studio and exa exactly just how great of an environment that is. Uh, inside of 7.5, we put a profiler to make it very easy to profile your application, see where your memory, CPU, how that's all going. Um, and then we've got a developer, an integrated developer portal. All right, so the why for a developer. As we look, it, you get into this why live tiles, why app connect, why all this stuff. What we've heard from developers is discovery is one thing, right? Separating yourself from a crowd of 400,000 apps is one challenge, right? Just getting discovered. But once you are on that phone, how do you further get discover, rediscovered? How do users then come back to you? Uh, on average, most apps are launched once, just once. Somebody downloads it, they put it there, they see the icon, they say, okay, cool, I want to go see what this does. And then if the, on an iPhone, for example, uh, which is probably the most mature of the smartphones, the user who's had their phone for a couple years has a, you know, at least or around 48 apps installed on their machine. So it's very easy to get lost in that noise once you've separated yourself from that noise of 400,000 apps. And furthermore, of that 400,000, um, only one, uh, actually, of those that do get downloaded, only 1% of those apps are used regularly. And this is data that originally comes from Flurry, but I, I've seen it backed up by Preemptive and a few other folks as well. And then if you look at, the, at the, the usage over the course of about 100 days, it's like this reverse hockey stick, which I know as me as a developer really depresses me. If I were to actually put in months of time building this app, and then just to know that, you know, <laughs> And in some cases, games are a little bit more sticky. And the stickiest of all are sports. And there you can kind of see every week, OK, I'll go back and check the scores, check the scores, check the scores. And then season's over, and nobody comes back. And so it's, how do you get past that? And so with App Connect, it, it is just about just-in-time apps, right? Whether you are in the picture hub and it, you say, okay, I, I took a picture. It's no longer sort of the hip somatic model where you go into the app to take the pictures. You can take the pictures from the phone and then it'll say, oh, here's the apps that you have that are related to pictures. Which one of these would you like to use? Again, bringing you back to that forefront and bringing you back into that user. 
in the video and the uh, and the music hub. I mean, I've got lyrics because that's my big thing. Is ha I can't understand half of what people are saying when they're singing, so I like going over lyrics and you get that, and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're saying that. Um, furthermore, and then in in search, let's say I'm I'm looking for movies. Black Swan's a little dated. It kind of tells you when I put some of these slides together. Uh, in it, you got the about. You do the swipe over, and you have show times. And then over here in extras, which is on the other side, you have the apps, right? And looks like all these are installed. But if one of these was not, uh, it tells you when we mock that up, fake IMDb. Um, you would also have a line in here which would just say, hey, install this now. And then one click over takes you right to that apps page in the marketplace and, and lets the user install it right there. So we try and, and really kind of help you cross that last mile. With live tiles, with 7.5, we try to making things a lot easier. We give the idea of doing local live tiles. So again, you don't always have to be connected up to the internet to get push notifications. You can do some notifications every hour that happen completely locally or while the user's in there. You give the, uh, the ability now to have multiple tiles. So in the case of this MSNBC, it's great that I get a little note that says, hey, you've got 15 notifications of news. And when I go in there, I find they're all in the style section. And I'm, as you can tell, I'm not really the stylish of a guy. So it, it, that doesn't really help me much. But I, within the app, I can say, you know what? I care about world news and I care about local news. And so the app can go ahead and create those two tiles out there and then allow you to uh, get notifications for just the pieces that, you, that matter to you. Or in the case of a weather app, uh, I, can, I can put a tile in there saying, here's the weather in Seattle, here's the weather in LA, here's the weather in New York, here's the weather in Hyderabad and Bangalore. And, and it gives me everything I really need to know. And then we also provide this idea of back of tiles. So the tiles can actually flip. And I think you saw that in some of the demos. It was just like, oh, hey, here's some neat tiles of your friends, and, and there's a couple of news items. Furthermore, and this is going to pop up up top. It, I, I always miss it when I, when I see it. But we add the ability to do deep toast notifications. And so the idea of deep toast, as well as on clicking on these tiles, is uh, a note may pop up there saying, hey, something important's happened. And what's the most frustrating thing for me as a user is I click on that and I end up at the front page of the app. Right? And you're just like, ah, oh, damn it. OK, so where would this be? They said there was a fire. I think that's local. OK, and then I'll go over this section. Uh, we about, uh, allow you the ability to put your eyes, attach your, your eyes right in there, and then one click takes you exactly to that story, exactly into that news item or, or element that you want to go into. And the same thing happens with these secondary tiles. Although you're displaying secondary information, they should still not come back to that main app. And so uh, I think in here, uh, quickly, I'm already running over. Um, I'm going to swap over and show you an app real quick. I constructed this uh, over, the, uh, over the weekend. Uh, biggest change for me is, I, I don't know if I was saying this to just some folks, but I was over at Nokia World last week. So I came from the States to Nokia World and then over here, and I've been interfacing with, like, across three different time zones. And so a big challenge for me was, OK, well, what time is it in, in place X? And so what I did here is I thought we would just really quickly build an application that allows you to create one live tile per time zone and just sort of show on the app what the times are. So let me bring this over. I will show the page. Uh, it's Microsoft technology and very similar to Silverlight as well as where we're going with Win8. Uh, you'll notice it's XAML based, so XML. I'm going to just quickly, because it's not very interesting watching me type, I kind of pulled in this stuff and I'll just kind of copy and paste it if I can just manage my windows appropriately. So I'm going to replace this content grid with a a grid which basically just at, at its simplest has a what label do I want to call it, what's the time offset, and then adding a tile. Then I will go to the code behind. I will add some namespaces. And you'll see it, it very similar to everything you've seen in C Sharp before. I'll put the uh, code that sits behind the button. And so within this button, what I'm doing, it's really not that hard. I'm taking today's time. I'm creating a bitmap 
173 pixels square. Just popping some white text over top of it. And then uh, layering in the hours or the time by uh, adding in the offset to today's current time. I am writing out to the isolated storage this thing called a test tile. And then saving it. And then what I'm doing here is is creating new tile data, setting the title to the, the name, that little home or, or London or whatever I want to call it, assigning the background image I just created, and then assigning on the back of the tile just when that was updated. Uh, because I'm, I would be creating a periodic task that runs every 30 minutes, knowing that it was you know, 502 is great, but it's not, you know, it might be 515 right now. And so at least having that back of tile say, oh yeah, by the way, this was created 10 minutes ago allows me to kind of get an offset going. And then the last thing I want to do here is I want to override the, uh, it help if I grab the whole function. I want to override the on nav navigated to event. So as I said, hopefully I picked the right brackets. Uh, we are creating a, because we use uh, deep, deep tiles or deep linking, uh, I'm creating a URI which and attaching this to the, to the tile, which says, go to the main page.xaml, which is the name of this file, and pass in the zone name and the offset. Right? So when somebody launches this live tile, I can then in interrogate that URI, say, OK, what's the zone name? What's the offset? And then populate that into the boxes. And so that's kind of all that is. Uh, I can go ahead and hit, I mean, it's Visual Studio. Hit F5 or click the debug button. This puppy then goes ahead, they build it. They deploy it right in the emulator. And so that's running. Uh, and then here you've got a back button, you've got the start button and the search. So let's say I go back. I want to pin this to the start, just to make it a little bit easier. And I really have not done much very interesting. It's just phone app four, because it's the fourth app I've created on here with a standard icon. I come in, and the time, this was just default data. I can click add live tile, you see it pops back. It now creates this tile that's two hours ago and says home. If you wait a couple seconds, the tile flips. And it says, okay, the offset's two hours ago. And it was updated 1137. I can come back in into the app again. And let's say here, I want to say London. It's much easier when you use your finger than here. Oh, you also notice uh, inside the XAML, I specified a different keyboard. So we've got this thing called input scope. And so basically, I just told it to use a postal code keyboard so I get the negative. Otherwise, I, I can't do negatives, which is minorly annoying. And I think London was five and a half hours. You can say add live tile. You'll notice that then pops up. Uh, coming into the app itself, it'll always come back with that default data. But if I come into London, for example, because I set that URI string and the on navigated to is parsing that, you'll notice it goes ahead and fills in the data. Now, I could use this in theory to say if I'm doing local news or say eBay item 1564. When I come in, it says, OK, I see this, and I'll jump you right to the item you care about. So yeah. And the SDK comes with Visual Studio. Uh, absolutely free. Uh, within the free model, the profile is there. We give you a marketplace test kit so you can actually run certification on your app, on your, on your uh, desktop before even submitting it. So we put about 80 to 90 percent of the marketplace failure rates inside this test kit so you can run it. And your chance of getting passed in, the cert in your first certification run is really, really high. And I think we're seeing an average of about two days on certification from publication to seeing it out there live and ready for, for sale. Uh, we support NuGet, so for you guys who are Microsoft devs, NuGet's a way where you can register a package and, and then just it will automatically go back and refresh. So if you've got a new ad control from us or from Google or from whoever, this will automatically make sure it's kept, kept in sync. Uh, as well as add SDK controls. Expression Blend is there for free, XNA Game Studio, and we give you the emulator that you saw there for free. <coughs> Developer Portal gives you one place, create.msdn.com where you can register, our forums are there, certification process, publication, managing your metadata, 
uh, getting reports in BI on how many sales have I had, how much money can I expect to see, because you're all going to be seeing lots and lots of money, uh, and then update management. So what I really want you to take away with this is that there's great opportunity here. We provide you a great integrated platform. It's a great canvas for you to paint your vision. We give you an integrated experience. You're not just an icon in the crowd. Uh, better partnership, we've got MO billing so that we, we found that users have, who have the MO billing option are about five times more likely to make a purchase. And over the next year, we're looking to have relationships with about 102 MOs worldwide. So as we go into all these net new markets at, and Nokia starts putting phones in all these markets that we otherwise would not have touched, MO billing is going to be there and it's going to be much easier for you to, to monetize your app. We've got one of the best ad SDKs out there. Uh, it gives you the highest eCPM of any of the ad providers. Uh, and it was US only for probably like 10 months or so. Uh, we've expanded to 11 countries, and they're adding a couple countries every month or so. So that, that's getting much, much better. Um, and we've, the thing to really call out as well that Nokia really provides is we've got a merchandising team that's not just focused on uh, Flickster and uh, Netflix and Facebook. The Nokia partnership gives us people who are managing merchandising portfolios worldwide. And of the, the apps that when you go into marketplaces, so, you know, here's five apps. Two of those are controlled at a global level, which are just top brands. And then I think there's like three that get updated every few days that are controlled by local, local merchandising managers. So they're selecting the apps that are relevant, that are necessary and, and good inside of that market. So we really provide a really great opportunity for you to, to get in front of users and not just manage that of revenue. Uh, which ideally yields great opportunity. We, of those that users that download, we're seeing about 10 average downloads a month, which is better than the average six for most other platforms. And we see some great turnover from our integrated trial functionality. So with that, um, get started. Uh, on Twitter, most of the community aggregates around this WPDev tag. Uh, Goresh Joshi is, is here in Bangalore, and he's sort of the, the local phone, phone champ. Um, my alias is Cliff Sim, should, should you care, and I've got cards for anybody who wants, but uh, Goresh is sort of your key, and he's got lots of resources to really get devs engaged and get them, get them highlighted. Tomorrow we've got lots of stuff going on. Uh, the Keynote 945, we're going to highlight opportunities that are, that are coming up, particularly for Indian mobile devs. And then uh, a deeper dive at noon, that was that app from zero to sort of done in 45 minutes. So with that, I want to say thank you, and I guess open up for questions. So uh, the fast app switching? Sure. So actually, I can even do this from the emulator. Um, yeah. So if you think about the state machine as, as an app's going along, you've got sort of running and activated. Then you've got the deactivation process, and then you've got sort of, sort of suspended animation or when it's not running, and then you've got this resuming state. And so when, when somebody hits activated and they swap out of that task, whether they're hitting the start button here um, or they hit the back button and come out of the app, it basically goes out of that running state. If you hit the back button and you back out of the app completely, we unload you. So that at that point, you just go to unloading and, and, and done. If somebody switches out uh, to the start menu and then launches into another app, say Internet Explorer, which I don't have a data connection, so it just comes to here, uh, the app is then put into, uh, you've got a snapshot of it, right? So here, uh, as I hold down the back button, you see the screenshot of the screen as it was just before it was suspended or, yeah. And, and so clicking on this app will just immediately kind of bring it back in. Um, and so we, we allocate a certain amount of memory, and we, we expect about six apps, five, six apps, to be put into this fast app switching mode. And that's more just resourcing, and, and just five seven, it seemed like a good number, I guess. Um, if that either runs out of resources or it exceeds that five, in order to, again, preserve that, that delightful user experience, we will tombstone that, and so, tombstone that app so it comes out of that, that isolated storage area and then gets, it gets serialized and popped into its isolated storage space. No, uh, not, not in terms of the foreground app itself. Now, there's ways of doing background processing, uh, either in terms of doing like background audio, 
where for radio stations, for example, you can swap out of there and it can still stream music, it can stream podcasts or audiobooks or whatever you want to do, as long as the user has a, has a connection. Um, or you can feed a bunch of music items in there, create a playlist, and feed it off to the, the, the audio agent, which would just sort of go through that playlist. Um, beyond that, we provide some background agents for doing file transfers. So if you want to do that, you obviously don't want the user hanging out in your app for you know, 15 minutes, and you can kind of do that in the background. But otherwise, we provide ability for a periodic agent. So you get a time slice, I think, a maximum of 15 seconds of processing every 15 minutes. Uh, and then the user is able to actually manage which background agents are, are running. So another part of the certification process is if you are doing stuff in the background using like a periodic agent, it, the app still has to be functional and work if the user shuts that off. Um, yeah, so background tasks. I can then come back in and, and manage which background asks I as a user can do it. And if your background, uh, if your background agent fails, I think, two times consecutively, we automatically sort of unschedule it so we're not running it down. I don't know if that, if, does that answer the question? Yeah, so we automatically get location. Uh, there's also a background location service. And so uh, as we built this, I don't know many details around it, but we worked with a bunch of geofencing as well as geocaching folks to make sure that it met their requirements. Uh, there, there's some granularity in that I think the most you can get an update is like every two minutes or every minute in terms of, of getting that, that update. And if somebody trips your geofence, you can kind of have your app come. You can put, pop a notification, and then they can kind of deep link in. Um, You get to see my updated location, but okay. I don't have to do anything. I may be using some other app, or my phone can be in, in uh, standby. Okay. Right? So in iOS, it's a very bad experience, actually. I mean, unless you bring in the app, it doesn't update at all. Right? Once, once it goes back to, but that's what I understand. Maybe correct me if I'm wrong. When it goes to the background, it doesn't work. So this problem is. Like you said, you follow the iOS model. Yeah. Is, is this problem exist in, uh, in Windows Phone, or is there a way to? I like that thing we're striking a middle balance there, because I believe the background location, and again, this fully you know, safe harbor statement hanging over my head. I, I, I have been a developer at one time, and I write some apps, but I'm, I'm not a full time developer. Um, I believe the background location agent allows you every couple minutes to get an idea and sync that back up. One of our sample apps is a stalker app. So you can kind of get it and run it, and then uh, it reports which building in the Microsoft you're in, and then someone can say, oh, we're my colleagues, oh, boom, 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 boom. Uh, it's not extremely granular in that it tells you real, 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 real time, but it gives you a phrase I, I, I like to use is good enough for government work. But So I'm out of time. I, I guess maybe one more question? Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I, I know as far as the, the chassis specs that are out there today and the chassis specs that, I, that I've kind of seen, uh, Qualcomm's still the basis as far as a chip, just because we want to make sure that uh, you don't get like a fragmented market of this app or well and this instruction set and not that instruction set. Cool. Okay. I'm hanging around here until they kick me out, at which time I'll hang around out there and, and go to the booth. But thank you very much for attending. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I'm sure that Anita will talk with you. The next question in the hall is Archimedes Spiral Mobile Devices and Cloud APIs under the Dignity Thank you.